So I welcome you all. This is um, something that we're calling a behind the scenes live. We will be uh, filming this or recording it. So you'll be able to watch on our um, YouTube channel. And I wanna bring your attention to uh, the next program on our schedule. It's um, something we're calling First Tuesdays. And these are once a month, or actually we're doing them every other month, but it's on the first Tuesday. And we're trying to spotlight different um, aspects of industry and work life in Amesbury. So we'll have Graham McKay, who's the executive director of Lowell's Boat Shop. It'll be another Zoom event. And uh, again, Tuesday, February 2nd at 7 p.m. And you simply sign up the same way you did this by going to our website and uh, registering on events. I wouldn't be the executive director if I wasn't thinking about money all the time. We are beginning our membership drive this week and you'll be getting a letter from us in the mail. Some of you already have jumped ahead and done that and I'm entirely grateful for that. But um, it is our membership drive and membership is the foundation for so much of what we do. Um, so I thank you for being our member in advance or already after the fact. And then as I was mentioning, this is part of a series that we're doing uh, behind the scenes. This one's live. We have about six other recordings. And what's been um, our plan with this is a way to um, you know, be uh, open and transparent about the whole process of developing the Industrial History Center. So you can go on to our YouTube channel. I think it's simply Amesbury Carriage Museum YouTube and you'll find it and you can see some of the different behind the scenes and then other programs that we have up as well. Meryl Goldsmith, who's our curator of online programming has been the mastermind behind this. And I think it's been a very effective way of keeping our, us out in front of our audience. So thank you all for being with us. So I'm gonna um, just quickly set the scene here for you and talk about the Industrial History Center and how we got from that cavernous space to where we are today. Um, one of the things that I look forward to is when the space is done, we do a lot of tours in the mill yard and through Amesbury. So this is an 1880 illustration from a bird's eye view of Amesbury. And our, our space is in an 1826 industrial building that was part of a complex that started as the Salisbury Manufacturing Company and later became the Hamilton Woolen Company. Here's a view 100 years later. This is about 1980 when the mill yard, just before the mill yard was um, under renovation and um, our building, you know, looking through what's called the Gateway Arch is right there. It had been a manufacturing space for the Bailey Company. When they left, the building was empty and it was then purchased by the Jardis family who are the current owners. And today it's Amesbury Industrial Supply. And this is a view of it, you know, um, a year or two ago, lovely fall scene so after renovation, you know, one of the gyms and the, the mill yard adjacent to the amphitheater and flatbread pizza company. So it was one of the first projects that was um, completely renovated. Greg Jardis donated space to the Amesbury Carriage Museum for us to create what we're calling the Industrial History Center. So here's our artist's rendering of what we want that space to look like. You know, expecting it'll be a gathering place for people who are just walking through the mill yard after their meals, where we want it to be a very active place that opens out that we can use to connect people to the, the town. And then, you know, again, another cartoon rendering by that shows the inside with our tagline, community stories start here. So this space, you know, active and furnished with exhibits and able to support programs is a challenge that's before us with Keith and I. This picture is about a week old. 
and I'm sorry, I didn't zoom in a little bit on the stonework, but you can see the reclaimed granite that's taking form, making the plaza that'll be the entry into our space. And tomorrow morning at 7 a.m., that brown door will be replaced with our storefront door. We'll be getting our, our permanent glass doors in the space. And then here's a view that mirrors the rendering that our artists had made that shows the state of our walls, that where the lights are on the shelves is a community meeting space. There's an exhibit area there. Our main wall, which will do donor recognition and welcoming. And then where that scaffolding is, is part of our exhibit area. And just as a reminder, Keith, here it is. This is where what it looked like, um, I think in December of 2019, we had cleaned it out. We had kind of taped off the floor, marking where the walls were gonna be. And this was just about, you know, takeoff time for our builder as we started our work. So it's, um, you know, as you said, cavernous, 50 feet wide. We have um, a little over 50 feet long. It's 2,800 square feet of space. And we've crunched into it just as much as we possibly can. So this is our work ahead. You know, we're starting at zero. We wanna create the visitor experience. We'll develop and install our exhibit. And I think this is probably the most important part of this is that this is ongoing. You know, we want to create a way that um, the Amesbury Carriage Museum can continue to engage our audience in our space. So, gives me great pleasure to welcome my good friend and colleague, Keith Ragone. I met Keith in, I think it was 1985, when I, I did an internship at Atwater Kent and Keith was doing design for that museum. Um, we worked together for seven years or so. And then after I left Philadelphia and came up to New England, Keith um, helped me at different places. And it's just been a treat to continue to have Keith as part of my um, group. So welcome, Keith. Well, it's great. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. And really, uh, congratulations to um, all of you for um, you know what what you've what you've managed to do so far, and I think that um, what you'll you'll still be doing as as um, you know as we enter this next phase, you know, it's it's really interesting to me to to imagine how uh, that space is um, inhabited, you know, how we how we uh, uh, create not only a welcoming space but one that can function. Um, you know, sort of uh, in, in terms of your program, but also interpretively. And I think that's the big challenge at the moment, um, how to create a, a, an exhibition program uh, that, does, that, that does any number of things. Um, uh, I guess, um, I guess I um, should, uh, John, John, do you want to talk a little bit about the project or should I just uh, um, sort of show some, some baseline projects that I think uh, can be catalytic in terms of the conversation tonight. Well, why don't, why don't Keith, um, I'm not sure exactly how to do this with either, oh, let me see what happens if I add spot. There we are, we're together. Um, I, um, why don't we just talk a little bit? Keith, um, you know, when I, we were beginning here, I knew we were gonna need an exhibit designer. And so very, Early on in the project, I invited Keith up to take a look and see what we were doing. So Keith gave a, a review and some recommendations. And then it's been a year that since then, and we finally put together a proposal and have engaged Keith as our exhibit designer. Um, we have a couple other people who will be working with us as advisors to the team. Got a historian, Gray Fitzsimons, who helped with our curriculum project. And then Carolyn Collins, who also works at Historic New England, she's an educator. So both Carolyn and Gray are on board to kind of be reviewers and advisors as our project takes form. But then also I know, you know, between staff and board members, there'll be other, you know, points of input here on the project. So what I, I, what I asked Keith to do, and I think we have about seven items on our punch list. You know, it's really to take, start at zero 
and help us come up with all the graphics and signage that we need to be um, effective in you know, creating a welcome experience for our visitors. Um, so there's our institutional signage, there's our welcoming and orientation. It even includes our donor acknowledgement system. But then we have a, a orientation exhibit that we want to install and then do a changing exhibit program as well. And then the final point is, you know, given all of this, how do we make this something that can be ongoing? How do, how do you transfer this to our staff and our community? So as we continue to use this space, it becomes an ongoing experience for our audience. That's what we talked about. Yeah, and I, and I think, um, you know, it, it's so great to be, um, you know, in collaboration in partnership with John again. Um, we have worked on uh, a variety of projects over the years, but certainly in, in the early 80s, the mid 80s, um, we were both uh, cutting our teeth in Philadelphia at the Philly History Museum, then called the Atwater Kent Museum. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's it, you know, a fabulous collection um, with a great story, um, but, but often uh, not, not with um, a set of goals that made it easy to understand uh, how to uh, get from a to B. And I think that uh, when John posits this idea, of what is a what, what makes a great exhibit, I think um, the, the first thing that comes to my mind is um, and I uh, is is a is an understanding by the client from my perspective um, about what what the goals are, you know, for for the institution, what the institutional goals are, and then um, what what the audience is and and how to then craft a set of goals for for meeting the expectations of of a particular audience um and i think that um certainly in the conversations that i've had with john over the past year or so um it seems to me that you guys are so well positioned to be able to really move this process forward um you understand what what those goals are for the most part i mean i think that you know, I think that we continue as we develop a project like this, we have meta goals, you know, and then for for each, you know, sort of um, set of elements uh, that that you're developing uh, interpretively another set of goals that um, not only um, that, that are designed to, again, uh, sort of meet the expectations of of your audience, but also to in a, in a larger way to, um, you know, sort of um, create a framework for the conceptual content driven uh, message or stories that that you want that you want to explore unfold tell um, be in dialogue with um, so I think that um, over the years um, I have to say that with two degrees in painting um, in fine art that um, um, designing exhibitions for museums was uh, sort of just a way to make some money, um, but it's turned into a practice now that's certainly informed by my, my um, great um, affinity for things, right? For objects and how they behave in space. But more importantly, over the years, um, especially uh, with, with, um, with teaching exhibition design at UArts in Philadelphia, which I've done for the past 15 years, in a graduate program there of museum studies, um, it, it, it's it's so much more than that. It's 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 um, certainly um, about material culture and giving life to an object and creating um, uh, making making entry points for for people that experience that object and that set of stories that the object engenders. Um, it it's um, it, it's it's for for me it's it's this combination the sweet combination of juxtaposition you know um, and and then storytelling um, that that allow um, meaning to emerge um, by way of the visitor's own experience um, I think that for me every you know the goal a personal goal is is to craft um, a set of relationships that. Um, you know, and that's content as well as design that um, allow the visitor uh, to uh, see themselves in a story, in the story that you're telling. Mm -hmm. 
So I think that, you know, um, I think that you, you all have been dedicated to doing that with your program. I mean, you, your, your commitment is to, um, to a community and to building that community. So I think that a transition to something that um, is somewhat more static than, than a public program or um, an outreach to, to the community, in the community, um, around the community, that, that, um, it, that static um, exhibition doesn't, doesn't need to be um, still. It can be full of life and it can be, um, it, it can create a, a sense of conversation and dialogue with the people that uh, interact with it. You know, and I think so, so. That's the that's really the, the the challenge, the sweet place for me in terms of uh, creating exhibitions. Um, you know, in, in my practice as a as a as a teacher, um, it it has been really critical for us to marry two um, two ideas in in the program, um, and I think this really helps me uh, sort of create the kinds of exhibits that I do. And I think the kind of exhibit that, that John uh, wants to have in your space. And that is this, um, you know, this, this relationship between interpretation, which is often seen, seen as a curatorial exercise. Um, so the relationship between interpretation and design and um, a conversation that happens between these two seemingly uh, different disciplines. I think what we do at UArts is we try to marry these two ideas um, 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 in, into, into a single way of thinking about um, exhibition development. Um, you know, and, and I, think, I think that we've been pretty successful in doing that. Certainly has you know, sort of changed my perspective in terms of, uh, in, in terms of what, certainly what I love, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's um, so easy to create something that is visually, you know, stunning, you know, with, you know, kind of perfect harmony and all of that. But um, it's so much more interesting uh, for me to be in the weeds of the content and to, and to be actually helping shape the content as, as we're also shaping the, the visual expression of that content, you know, with, with objects or without objects, with, with a variety of voices. So that's what I hope, um, you know, I can bring to this, to this project. And I yeah. think that, um, you know, I think we're positioned to, to do that. I, I think Keith, that, you know, you're, you've taught me a lot about that. And I guess, I, I think you, it would be great for you to share some of those, you know, illustrations of recent work what one thing I wanted to just put out there, though, too, is um, how different our world is. I mean, I, I think COVID ha is profound in how it's changed, you know, our opportunity. I think it positions a project like ours to even be more crucial in our community. And yeah. I think there's a lot of learning that's going to happen as we go through this process. And you use the word prototyping with some of the um, opportunities that we have. And I think as a concept, you know, being willing to take risks and see how things work, to know that, you know, this is the beginning and not the end is our important, you know, aspects of, of what we're gonna create at the History Center. Right, I mean, I would argue that, you know, the opportunities you have uh, before you at the moment, you know, and I think those opportunities are in large part, understanding what the resources are that you have. I mean, you have um, yeah. spent a huge amount of resource just getting the space together, you know, mm -hmm. and um, building uh, a program as well as an audience. And I think that um, I think it would be um, sort of, uh, I, you know, I mean, for some institutions, you, you know, um, a five hundred thousand dollar or two million dollar exhibition. And, and you know, project is is nothing. But right. but I know I know for you guys that's not the case. And I think right. that you know, for the museums, for many of the museums uh, that I work for, and they're small to mid-sized places, mm -hmm. um, understanding and managing resources are critical. And I think that even even in a large institution, to um, to to ignore some of the opportunities you have to be in conversation with your audience, right, and your stakeholders, 
around the ideas is is just a missed opportunity. Yeah. So I argue that you should really think about the first phase of this project was which is the you know the fit out of mm -hmm. of the space with interpretive elements um, to think about it less as a finished and finite um, exhibition and more a laboratory. You know, oh, I okay. think that if, if you went into into the development um, of of a series of ideas that you know you will test, you know, um, and uh, prototype, you know, mm -hmm. I think I mean. You know, one of one of the great, great, um, yeah, one of the great things about developing exhibitions is that is that formative um, evaluation piece, and that and and then the front end piece that that you can test, so that when you are ready to spend, um, you know, a um, million dollars on your interpretive exhibit, um, you know exactly, um, you know right. what the stories are and how you want your visitors to. Um, read those stories. So I think that, you know, John and I have been talking about this a lot. Um, and I think that we want to, you know, create um, a space that welcomes, you know, a space that's a threshold to a series of different kinds of ideas, you know, around the mission of the Industrial History Center. Um, and, and then and then to um, sort of employ a set of iconographic imagery that that holds the space, but also is a portal into um, some of the the larger stories you want to tell, the, um, and as well as you know, as well as some of the the, the details in in those stories. So uh, you know, we haven't gotten to um, a, you know a, a clear definition of what um, you know what the themes are or how best to um, employ um, voice around those themes. But I think that we're um, closer to understanding what what the goals are, um, you know, both in terms of you know resource, but also in terms of um, outreach to audiences, um, as well as um, you know the 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 timeline, you know, the chronology, mm -hmm. the, the historical narrative that I think is 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 pretty important to understand. Um, but but within the context of um, a, a more contemporary story that allows people to allows your community to understand uh, the past as prologue. You know, yep. to use that Why cliche. Don't you keep, show some of your stuff, and then we'll sure. come back. Yeah, sure. I'm going to take my spotlight off, and you can share your screen. Sure. So um, you know, I've been building, designing exhibits. You know, since. Um, since the you know since the early 80s um first in philadelphia where i studied painting and then in new york city where i studied painting again um only to um be um you know to be embedded in 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 the museum um community um i've had the great you know pleasure to develop clients you know uh, primarily in the mid-atlantic um I've, I've done some some great projects with Historic New England, and John and I have worked on a number of projects, Strawberry Bank and um, the New Hampshire Historical Society, John? Maine, Maine, Maine Historical, Historical Society. Society. Um, and, and, um, and, and recently, um, a project um, in, in New York for the Henry Street Settlement, um, working with Ellen Snyder Bernier um, on, on a wonderful project that uh, celebrates the anniversary of um, Lillian Wald in the progressive era, um, but but closer to home um, in Philadelphia with 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 small clients and mid-sized clients. I'm working now with the Delaware Museum of Art on an exhibition that um, actually a reinstallation of their entire permanent collection, um, and and that's a fascinating project because of the um, the depth and the breadth of that collection, but also. Um, you know, the specificity of, you know, their illustration collection and Howard Pyle collection. They have this really amazing collection of pre-Raphaelite paintings. So trying to blend, um, you know, the, the stories of American iconography with, with these, this, these other disparate parts have, has, have been a really interesting challenge. Delaware has committed itself to being in a conversation with its um, with its community and has done a ton of prototyping um, around um, around big ideas and narrative elements. 
Um, so the studio is small, it's me. Um, I over the years have um, developed a number of partners in the field um, that, that I work with, you know, from um, interpretive developers and script writers to fabricate, fabricators and installers. So um, it's, it's been, um, I would say, you know, the mission of, or the business model for me has been to um, cr create um, a studio that is nimble, right? And that can be responsive um, while still allowing me um, the opportunity to be, to wear a different hat, which is my hat as, mm -hmm. as a painter. Um, let me advance this. Oh. Um, a project that opened last year, um, this time, um, actually in October, was a project for the Motor Museum in Philadelphia. You may know them. Um, they are a museum of the College of Physi Physicians and is, uh, is, is primarily um, a, a, a museum of um, medical oddities. Um, every museum in Philadelphia would love to have the visitation that the Winter Museum has uh, because of its odd and weird collection. But they also um, are dedicated to um, creating exhibits that are more contemporary, you know, that um, are exploring uh, the nature of of, of stories within uh, the, the genre of medicine. So um, they um, were funded by, by uh, the Pew Charitable Trust as well as IMLS and other funders mm -hmm. to create um, an exhibition that cel well, celebrated not, is not really the right explored. word. Well, explored, but also codified as a, as, as a epic moment in American life of uh, the 1918, uh, you know, influenza pandemic mm -hmm. um, with, with no expectation that in less than three months um, we would be in the middle of um, a, a, you know, another hundred year uh, pandemic. Um, this exhibition was called Spit Spreads Death. Um, they had very few objects for this exhibition, but mm -hmm. they knew that they wanted um, to work with um, an artist or a series of artists to to uh, create an intervention um, within the sort of narrative framework of this this uh, historical um, this historical uh, novella uh, that mm -hmm. that they would unfold and uh, so they worked with um, they worked with a, um, a collaborative group out of Great Britain um, to uh, create a performative piece uh, for the community they they wow. actually. Uh, staged a parade um, up Broad Street, if you know Philadelphia, from the Navy Yard to City Hall, um, that that um, chronicled um, um, those that uh, died in Philadelphia. Um, there, there were, you know, hundreds of names, and it was it was a celebratory but also somber um, mm -hmm. art piece um, that was um, that was filmed and is a central sort of element in the exhibition with a historical narrative that runs around it and these are just a few shots um, from that from that narrative um you know really interesting you know if we had uh, if this exhibit um it, you know had been three or four months later um right. it would have been a very different exhibition right I think. that's interesting and, so is it know, still up keith is it still, still up? It's, it will be up for five years. And I think, you know, we've, we've already made some changes to accommodate, um, you know, um, the, the, the fast changing uh, contemporary um, uh, postscript yep. of the story. Um, and I think that, you know, they've been struggling with audience now, you know, oh, um, right. the museum is closed, it's open, it's closed. It's, yep. it's, you know, it's been very difficult to, to, right. you know, sort of manage it as, um, you know, as a new exhibition and, and to really be able to, to do the kind of summat summative evaluation that I think they would love to do. Right. Um, it was um, um, a really interesting exercise um, working, working with um, the historical content as well as um, a contemporary artist uh, trying, to, trying to manage that, trying to figure out how these two worlds um, would um, live uh, be married um, mm -hmm. together, you know, um, because they were, 
in some ways very separate in terms of experiences. And I think that, you know, I think that we um, were, were able to do that. And it, um, the, the filmic piece, which is performative, a performative documentary, um, really sets the tone. It's, it's very moody. Um, it's, it's very, it, it, it settles um, the visitor down immediately yep. <clears throat> and creates a particular kind of reverence for um, then the material um, that is the story, the, the chronology of that story. Um, and then I, I wanted to go back to the Philadelphia History Museum where John and I both, you know, sort of started and we developed a series in, in, um, in 2012, um, a, ser a, a master plan uh, for the museum. It had been closed for three years uh, on a major renovation and a new director was coming in and uh, there, were, there were lots of expectations, but no clear path um, to understand to understanding uh, the opportunities within um, the, their programming and, and their stories. And um, it was interesting because it, it not only allowed us to uh, develop particular exhibits for, for, for the quote unquote new museum, but, but also to position the museum as a different kind of place as, as the new Philadelphia History Museum. So we worked really hard to um, sort of um, um, create a series of exhibitions. The, the one, um, the, this one is a, a very small exhibition in, in foyer spaces. Um, the, the museum uh, leadership wanted a, an orientation gallery. So this orientation gallery takes you across 300 years of uh, Philadelphia, of Philadelphia history from left to right. Um, it's written in a, um, a sort of um, first person narrative um, uh, with um, the addition of um, first person narratives um, from contemporary, um, contemporary um, citizens of Philadelphia. Right. So the voices, um, there is a public, um, radio station uh, next door and we uh, put out a call and uh, taped, I don't know, um, 20 or 30 voices that were then crafted into a series of, a series of uh, interviews um, that, um, that played alongside of this unfolding historical narrative and, and really set the tone for, um, for, for what, what we were trying to do um, at the museum in, in, in terms of tenor, um, in, in terms of point of view, in terms of voice. So this was called City Voices. And then there was a, a series of galleries on the second floor of the museum, um, which, um, which where they were really dedicated to having their most um, important objects, you know, Penn's Wamba Belt, um, George Washington's desk when he was in the president's house in Philadelphia. Um, George, George Meade's uh, sword from the Civil War. I mean, these, these really iconic things. Um, but we, we, we put them, we built a new, a different kind of context for them. We, um, it was called the ordinary, uh, the extraordinary and the unknown. This particular, you know, sort of treasures exhibition. Um, and and we, we really um, worked hard to um, um, position different, different, um, different ways to look at material culture. This was almost a primer uh, for how to unpack um, an object, you know, with, with stories and then how to see yourself inside, um, you know, that particular object next to another object and inside that story. You know, so I think it was, um, you know, it was, it was a really interesting and I think beautiful exhibition. These are just a few, a, a few images. Um, <clears throat> it was anchored by a set of uh, questions like if objects hold stories, who gets to tell the stories? I mean, pretty obvious, right? But um, it, 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 the, the entire galleries, um, you know, um, took, took on that voice of uh, inquiry. <clears throat> and in this case, you know, um, three marble busts that, you know, aren't fantastic. I mean, they're just three marble busts of three white guys um, next to um, this really fantastic um, late 19th century, early 20th century mugshot book. You know, and it's, um, you know, these simple juxtapositions that seem pretty obvious, 
um, they're almost cliched, but they end up uh, creating this uh, really amazing, uh, um, I don't know, uh, I, I, dynamic um, uh, dissonance, I, I, you know, um, set of contrasts that, that then um, be, begin to um, make, make the vis visitor, or I should say allow the visitor to think about uh, the power of objects. Um, mm -hmm. A simple object like a pair of boxing gloves um, but they belong to uh, Joe Frazier um, next to, you know, um, a, a, a book of Psalms uh, that was owned by an important Quaker in Philadelphia um, next to um, a, um, a port glass that was um, held by Benjamin Franklin. So I don't know, um, this is an exhibit or a series of exhibits rich in material culture, culture um, uh, unlike the Mutter Museum that um, had hardly any objects at all. Um, so I think that um, traveling, um, traveling inside a, a set of um, content narratives and developing um, ways to unfold those narratives um, with objects or without objects is, um, is always a challenge. And I think that it will be an interesting challenge for you guys. I, I mean, I can see uh, contemporary voices inside the context of right. your, you know, a chronology that, that, that talks about the development of Amesbury as an industrial powerhouse over, um, <clears throat> I don't know, what, what, 250 years, 300 years? Yep. 300, yeah, <clears throat> definitely. <clears throat> Um, yeah, we should come back and talk a little bit more about Atwater Kent, but yeah, um, it's great looking at that material. Thank you. Yeah, um, and, and then, you know, for me, it's always, I mean, every project is um, a set of opportunities and um, a new um, learning experience for me. And, you know, I think that that's the most amazing thing about this work, you know, to be able to work with museums that are charged with um, you know, holding uh, particular legacies, and um, even even clients that um, that um, you know who, whose mission is to um, sort of protect the rights and freedoms of um, their constituents, um, which is the case of the William Way um, Community Center, which is an LGBTQ center in Philadelphia with a really important archive um, that um, really um, chronicles um, that community, um, at least over the last 50 years. And um, in 1965, Philadelphia um, was the site for one of the first um, um, public um, displays um, by by uh, gay Americans uh, in protest. Um, it was called the Reminder Days. And um, so they, they really wanted to um, celebrate that moment. Um, this exhibition opened at the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia <clears throat> in 2015. And um, an exhibit that had very few objects in it, um, but an extremely powerful story. Um, that really unfolded um, the, the, the story of gay rights, um, the Constitution, and the Supreme Court wow. um, over over a fifty year period, and it you know had a fair amount of media in it. Uh, there were some really great uh, films from the 1965, 1966, 1967. There were three rallies on July fourth in front of the State House, in front of the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia. Um, <clears throat> those three or four years um, predated Stonewall. And um, at that point, um, you know, at that point, it all shifted to New York um, mm -hmm. when Stonewall happened and uh, the, you know, the nascent um, movement um, became uh, a very different uh, movement at, at that point. So we, we actually, you know, celebrated the Philadelphia story, but then brought it, um, Full full circle, um, and um, included Stonewall and you know uh, Supreme Court decisions and uh, you know um, the you know the popularization of um, LGBTQ stories in the media. It was it was a it was a really amazing 
exhibition, uh, mm. a temporary exhibition in about 2,000 square feet uh, <clears throat> designed to travel mm -hmm. um, and, and mostly and mostly flat. Um, it opened um, two weeks before the Supreme Court decision on gay marriage. Mm. Um, so I don't have a slide of that, but we had a, a room devoted to, it was a, it was a talk back uh, for audience on, on, um, on, on the position of um, uh, gay, uh, gay, you know, um, marriage equality right. um, for against. Um, and it was, a, you know, so it was a, a, a perfect moment in time for this exhibition. <clears throat> the, um, the Philadelphia History Museum had expressed some interest in doing it and backed out. And um, we brought the idea to the National Constitution Center <clears throat> and they uh, flipped out. Uh, the, their curatorial staff uh, signed up <clears throat> and we developed the exhibit and um, they got a new director in, in the meantime, who uh, was um, really not happy um, to have this exhibit at the National Constitution Center, thinking that um, they would suffer um, the consequences. Um, I think at that point, um, well, I won't get into the politics of it, but um, <clears throat> he he came around and um, in the end um, understood um, what a powerful statement it was for the National Constitution Center within the construct of the Constitution and the Supreme Court um, to do this exhibition, um, especially, you know, at this moment in time when marriage equality was um, when that ruling came down. <clears throat> so it's, uh, this is an exhibition I was really I'm just so proud to be a part of and mm. one uh, that allowed me to um, sort of uh, understand so much more deeply um, the, the challenges of uh, a community uh, that, uh, that had been marginalized uh, to the degree that um, I, I just had, I had no, no idea. Um, and then another exhibit, a much smaller exhibit, you know, for of all people, the Union League of Philadelphia, um, we did two exhibits um, that were consequential in my mind. Um, the last exhibit was called Ballot Box, America's Fight for the Vote, and it opened in October. Um, and um, really was a narrative, um, and Helen Snyder Grenade developed that, the studio uh, <clears throat> curated and developed the exhibit for them with a lot of input. But it was a story of um, voting rights, you know, um, over the last 250 years. Um, it was, a, it was a, um, an exhibition that was developed during COVID. <clears throat> it, you know, we mm. developed it last, last year, um, this time. And um, of course the collections we had, there aren't many collections of um, voting rights material um, to begin with. And um, the lenders that we had hoped to borrow from uh, nobody was, everybody, there was, there was no loan, loans available uh, because of the pandemic. But eBay was there mm. and uh, we were able to mine eBay. <clears throat> and actually, um, this is, a, this is a, a ballot box from the 20s, huh. eBay. And huh. on, the other side of this, on the other side of this wall is a, a portable um, voting station, eBay. Uh, from Florida, uh, circa 2000, uh, with its hanging chats, oh. <laughs> and 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 we were able to find uh, poll tax receipts. Um, so it it was really pretty interesting um, crafting an exhibit without stuff, uh, but with a giant story um, mm -hmm. crafted in a way that was um, that met um, the the ethos of our client. Um, but but also managed to push um, push the the envelope in terms of um, an un, an un, um, an unwinding story you know that was happening uh, as as this exhibition was being developed mm -hmm. and likewise uh, an exhibit that we did for them uh, two years ago um, on uh, on monuments it was called carved in stone and this was. Uh, uh, you know, the, um, the Lee um, monument was right. uh, just, uh, taken down and 
you know, there were, um, the, the, you know, there was Charlottesville and, 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 mm -hmm. and all of that um, was erupting at this time. And they decided to really take it on and to um, really try to tell the story of, of monuments. Um, and again, um, their curator got sick at the beginning of our process and the director came to me and said, what should we do? And I said, I, I have the people to help you do this. And, you know, I brought um, two of my colleagues in from UArts and we crafted the story with, with our client, of course. <clears throat> but um, some really interesting conversations uh, about that. Um, so it's a series of juxtapositions, um, you know, um, George III uh, coming down off his pedestal uh, next to um, uh, an object from their collection, uh, a bust of Washington. And, you know, uh, that's, that sort of was a real entry point to this exhibit. Um, you, you sort of got, got it from the very moment you entered um, how the story would um, evolve. That's a great and, topic, Keith. <laughs> Yeah, it was, um, it, it was really cool, you know, it was, you know, across, you know, the, it's a small space. Um, it's a space with a lot of attitude. Right, um, it's in a very fancy building. Very fancy building. Um, so that's always a, 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 a question. Mm -hmm. But I, I, um, I wanted to call the exhibit carved in stone question mark. Mm. And, and decided, awesome. decided to um, use this, um, we, we created this, um, um, oak veneer, plywood, mm. monument base, right? Um, um, this, you know, and it's obvious that it's oak veneer. It, it has a, a lovely finish on it, uh, but it's uh, it's not stone, that's for sure. And right. it, but but to to really begin to play with um, this this uh, this idea, you know, I mean, um, what, what what does it mean? You know, why do yeah. we why do we make monuments? And, and, you know, their, their story um, in large part was a story about uh, the failure of reconstruction, you know, mm -hmm. and um, the lost cause and, um, you know, and, and ended with um, a story about um, a new monument in Philadelphia that had just um, the year before been placed on its pedestal <clears throat> on the apron of City Hall. Mm. And that was, that was a, st uh, a statue of Octavius Cato. Um, um, you you guys must know him. He's a abolitionist, black, um, you know, amazing character in, in the life of Philadelphia that was assassinated on um, on on um, voting um, uh, day um, mm -hmm. in eighteen. I forget the date, um, but it was uh, it, it was really wonderful to end this exhibition with um, with with Cato being lowered onto his pedestal. Um, the mm. previous panel on this wall um, here has um, Lee being lifted off of his pedestal in much the same way, you know? <clears throat> so, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I'm in the weeds here, but um, it, it's, it was so exciting to work on this exhibit. <laughs> and to, you know, sort of um, ask you know, some really important questions, you know? Um, so, so we should give, I think we're, I'm a little worried we're almost at eight o'clock. We should give, um, you know, our audience some time here too. Okay. Yeah, I, just the last slide, you know, so mm -hmm. art exhibits are pretty easy, right? Um, you know, it's just, uh, and this is an exhibit for the Delaware Art Museum. A really is, different attitude. Is that um, up still, Keith, at the Art Museum? Uh, no, this is down. It was a temporary exhibit and the curator wow. um, put two characters together Andrew Wyeth and John Ruskin. Yeah. And it was like, how, how do I do this? You know, well, yeah. this, this makes sense to me. But, but her point was, you know, both of these artists had very similar ideas about um, nature and how to look at nature. And mm -hmm. in the end, um, their te techniques were so very, very, um, very, very married. Um, so mm -hmm. this idea of eye on nature, um, I, mm -hmm. I wanted to create a space that, um, referred to sliding barn doors and windows with shutters, yeah. and the framing of, you know, um, the view onto nature. Anyway, this is, uh, this is just a different, completely different attitude, but I wanted you to see it. Um, exhibits mm -hmm. take on a life of their own and really are driven by the, um, are, are driven by the, the, you know, the, the goals that, that mm -hmm. we set, you know, uh, for them. Anyway, thanks for, sorry, that was, I hope it wasn't too long-winded. Well, but 
I love that work. I remember at Maine Historical when I was responsible for starting you know, a very organized program, we had about 20 different people who were part of the exhibit team. You know, and when you look at what goes into doing any one of those projects, it's, you know, amazing. You know, there's a lot of hands that get in the soup, so to speak. Yeah. So um, let's see. Um, yeah, we have a question. I, I guess I'll just um, look at a couple of the things on our chat. Um, uh, John and Gail, you know, um, you're asking a question, you know, about how these exhibits that Keith has shared with, which are rich with national themes or relevant items, you know, how do we do that? And, you know, how can we find a way to inform our exhibit in Amesbury? You know, I'm wondering, um, you know, I think that's going to be part of our challenge. You know, where do we find the voice? What's the, the story? And I know we have them, you know, whether it's George McNeil or we think about what happened, you know, at the depression and the closing of the auto industry or the evolution of, you know, technology in the textile making, you know, it's the human voice that I think is going to be strong. Yeah, and it's, it's a, it's the legacy of, you know, of, of, um, of, of people working together, you know, for 250 years or over 250 years. It's, it's, you know, and, mm -hmm. And um, um, you know, I think I think trying to you know bring those voices forward, mm -hmm. uh, maybe within the context of um, you know the legacy of family voices, um, you know, could be a really interesting way to to think about that. I mean, this is a story about it's a story about work, right? As well as innovation, mm -hmm. um, you know, as as well as place. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, these are these are pretty broad themes, and I think that. Um, you know, there are, there are really specific narrative elements that uh, chronicle the growth of right. very over time. But, you know, I think if we can craft a set of themes that people today are, you know, dealing with in their own lives, um, you know, around work, around place, around community, right. um, that, that that's, you know, that seems to me, that seems to me to be the key. Uh, Pat, the key. Yeah, and Pat Boyle Steed is, you know, voicing this in a slightly different way. You know, Philadelphia is a community of around a million people. You know, and and so for a town like Amesbury with seventeen thousand, you know, how you you know we'll be challenged to give status and grace and meaning to the questions that we ask, but. I think we can do it. You know, I think it's, you know, and I think this is where that whole um, exercise of prototyping comes in, where we, you know, do make a, an attempt and we're open to feedback and we're willing to do it maybe wrong the first time, but then go through a process of reinstallation and new, new presentations. I think I, I would argue that it's never wrong, right? If you're in dialogue with your community, um, it's 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 a dialogue. It's not nothing's wrong about that, you know. And it may not, you know. Okay, so maybe the exhibit uh, doesn't have the same power that you you want it, or it's, mm -hmm. it's it's too temporal, or you know, there there may be um, challenges. But I think there there are far more opportunities. Philadelphia History Museum, one of our, you know, recommendations was, you know, this museum is the people's museum, you know, you need to be in the neighborhoods, you need right. to be in the neighborhoods, you know, um, dealing, you know, working with um, all kinds of people, you know, not, right. you know, not uh, center city elites, but, you know, right. those that are marginalized in, in, in very, um, in, you know, severe ways, and, and they never really, you know, they never really bought that as a, operating principle. And I think that, you know, uh, and maybe because it, it's just too big, right? It's a million people. Um, but I think that, you know, I think that you could take that on in the same way. And, and I think you have um, a, a far greater opportunity to um, connect with people, you know, in, in, lots of, in lots of different ways. So I think that, um, 
you know, I mean, I, you know, if you're if if you know if your goal is to make this a national museum, you know, for a national story, then you know maybe maybe not, you know. <laughs> but if if but if if your goal is to connect with your community and to be a community hub, yeah, to, and to tell the story of the small town, you know, with a big footprint, yeah, you know, in ter in terms of you know place making, I you know I think you have. Um, you know, you know, just ton of opportunities to do that with, um, you know, with, with in a lot of different ways. You know, I, I think that that's where you should start. That's what you should begin. I'm seeing um, some messaging that's acknowledging a group of volunteers that we're calling the in Industrial Survey Group. You know, and these are people like Mike and Tom and, um, you know, others, I don't see, uh, Ron. Uh, Kleninsky, we've gone out and we've, you know, developed background about these companies. You know, I think our current challenge is to shine a light on the people. So it's a human story and that can happen across time. My greatest, I remember this really clearly, and I was working at a small museum in Manchester, New Hampshire, and we opened an exhibit called Manchester Stories. And at the opening, there was a family looking at a presentation that we did about a school teacher. And they said, oh, look, I can just imagine, you know, mom's story right here. You know, and so, you know, we had created an environment where people could, you know, um, impose their experiences and the history, the framework that we had created. So in a way it was enabling. And, you know, I think that's kind of an opportunity that we have with what we do here. You know, it's a, a, you know, community stories start here, give a, a voice to the people and see how that, that goes. Um, I think it's all in the balance, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, how, you know, how, I mean, I think you can, you know, uh, give, give agency to those voices by right. including them in a narrative, you know, uh, that is uh, celebrating uh the past you know um in, in terms of innovation you know in terms right. of place make all that yeah things telling stories and finding voices to those things that are different and surprising um so others questions i mean we could open it up and you know let people unmute i actually don't know how to do that but do people want to voice a question um and uh, if you can unmute, go for it. Let's get Keith while we got him. Okay. Just want to say goodbye to, to Greg, who's about to leave. Um, again, congrats on the space. Um, John, this is Susan, and I have a question. Sure, Susan. Uh, does the theme always come first, or can an object determine the story? I, you know, we we sense that there are a lot of people in Amesbury that have things and stories yeah. that are sort of hidden. Does right. the theme, can the thing come first or does the theme have to come first? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess that's a really, I mean, I guess I like to begin with why. So there's a reason that you begin doing a project and, you know, that can lead to an object, but, um, you know, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think you have to ha be guided by a sense of purpose. And then that helps, you know, you make some choices. Even if you only have one thing, it, it doesn't have to, it doesn't, it's not, um, you, you know, it's not objective, even though it's an object. You know, it's how you tell the story that shines the light on it. And um, I think that can be interesting too. Um, I'm thinking of uh, the Maryland Historical Society when they did that exhibit mining the museum. And this had been a very traditional place that, you know, often, you know, was criticized for only telling things from the perspective of a white person. So they opened it up and they had a black artist come in and he took many of those very same objects that people were familiar with and put it in a really different context. So that, I mean, that, that's another, Part of an exercise but Keith what do you think you know I mean I think I think it um, comes back to the goals right I yeah. mean if you know that you want to uh, engage your audience in in a in a series of very specific ways 
mm. um, and, and building a collection around objects that they may have. Um, so that, that may be a goal. So that then allows you to create a construct for a series of things that uh, are disparate, you know, and unconnected. Um, and, and that may then allow you to say, oh, well, here's an idea that can marry all these objects together as, you know, as, as a set of stories or as a particular story. So I think, you know, I think, you know, again, come back to the goals, you know, and yeah. okay. If I, I would say, yeah, if you're, if you're, if you have a goal to engage your community in that way, yeah. then I think, I think you're not obligated to um, consider those objects, but I think that you pro probably can, can mine those, you know, yeah. that material culture in ways that uh, allow you to kind of, build a, a, um, a piece of the story as a primary theme right. or as a second theme? Anyway. I did a, a project <laughs> at Maine Historical and we called it Passionate Pursuits. And we invited 12 different collectors who had a specialty in a particular area. And each of them you know, made a choice of about 12 objects. So you came into this gallery and everyone was focused on the story of Maine but it was told through someone who had technical things or Native American carvings or photographs or, you know, steam gauges even. And, you know, just <laughs> as an accumulation of stuff, when you looked at it all together, you got a sense of Maine, but you also got a personal perspective on, you know, what these people had done. It was kind of fun, you know, right. but very rich in objects. Um, but I, one of the things that I, that, gets me excited about the community approach to the museum is that it, it, it engages the larger history, but cuts across it. We have the same people building carriages and bicycles and automobiles. They, you know, all those, these big uh, external large forces uh, operated, but, but people had daily lives that came in contact with them and they, they wove together uh, yeah. those things. Uh, and that 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 can allow us to open up the history in a way that's both personal and also uh, enlightening. Maybe get yeah. get some new insights uh, right. into what's happening. Yeah, I agree. I think it's it's fun learning about that. Shall we take one more question for Keith? Anybody else want to ask um, something you'd like to bring up and share? All right, going once, going quote. Oh, Dan well, from, yeah, no Mike. Saying anything, I'm just gonna say, um, I think one, in, in a sense, I see there's almost an advantage uh, that I think much of the community is how I described uh, our museum group when we started out six years ago, we knew almost nothing about what had happened in Amesbury. And from what I can sense, uh, the, the history, I know it calls itself carriage town, Amesbury does. People are convinced we made a lot of carriages apparently, but by and large, it's all been, uh, uh, there's been a communal amnesia on it. It collapsed so completely in, in, in the, with the depression and, and didn't recover. And so it just died out. The people who were doing auto body work went to Framingham and other places where there was that kind of work to be had, employment. Uh, and the town has collectively forgotten a lot so that part of what we can do is, it's not, it's not majestic, it's just start reintroducing people to what went on here. They're, they're not right. aware of it. I mean, I've talked right. to people, I had no idea that right. we ever produced textiles in Amesbury. Right. And, uh, and so that I think some of this can be fairly simple and there's right. enough of it, it can, it can rotate quite a bit in terms of being able to turn over a, a fairly simple exhibit of, well, here's something we did, and that's an yeah. exhibit for a while. There's, here's other things that happened here, other things that happened here. I mean, even some of the more recent things like the circuit board manufacturer, uh, which is still at this point, probably a generation and a half ago, uh, but or close to that, uh, I, I don't know that there's much known about it at this point. Yeah. And uh, so yeah. that we, we have a lot we can mine and present to people and some of it's in the industrial sense. Some of it, uh, one of the things I've always 
wanted to do was was get it. There, there were a lot of homes that belonged to people that were involved in these things and right. you know, that, that still exist in town that could be highlighted. There's just, uh, I think a lot and, and just sort of a fairly simple nature of reintroducing the town uh, to its history. Right. You know, I, and I think um, we also, and that's part of what is a process here, is we want to be open to things that we, you know, are, that are new to us. So, you know, it's not us who are telling a history, it's we're enabling our community to come forward with stuff that'll surprise us and surprise our audience as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, I think it's really important that, um, and I think you're committed to doing this, but this, this idea of, you know, ex ex exhibitions that are both um, semi-permanent and um, temporary, but also programming. And, you know, there, there's a suite of uh, things that you can do um, that, um, you know, from, from being in the community itself to ha having the site be a hub for the community and in a mm -hmm. series of different, different ways, mm -hmm. you know, so all that gets blended together and, um, Mike, some of what you're suggesting, you know, may be better for a public program, for instance. You know, yeah. somebody comes in and talks about the textile industry, for right. you know, or you know, you know, some aspect of 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 history. Um, it doesn't mean that that's not in the exhibit components, um, but you know, it's 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 a series of um, sort of possibilities, opportunities that you create for your your audience, mm -hmm. you know, your community. Mm -hmm. So I just keep that, in, you know, keep that in mind. And I think that certainly the program piece um, can influence um, the, the more um, permanent nature yeah. of the exhibits that get developed or, right. you know, or, you know, or, or, or those parts of the exhibit. I mean, maybe there is uh, always a rotating mm -hmm. set of pieces or elements in, in the quote unquote permanent exhibits that, right. you know, that are responsive, you know, to right. a question. I have a question about textiles. I understand that that may have been, you know, so um, it gets it gets integrated in some way. I think, you know, I think that you, um, you know, I mean, I think you, I, you feel like it's, you know, it feels like really scrappy, you know, your mm -hmm. your 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 evolution, and now you, now you're in this great, you know, new space that seems very professional and clean and. I'm sure will be beautiful. It doesn't mean that you can't be nimble and scrappy right. and responsive, you know. And I think that that's that's so um, a small, you know, museum like uh, Amesbury right. um, the Museum can can really afford to do that. Um, right. So I, th I think that becomes your part of your personality, your complexion. I think um, you know we're also going to have different types of environments. You know, the history center may be the most traditional or not, but then, you know, we're looking at possibly having an open storage space where we have a, a storefront that we've used for displays and we've got, you know, uh, business owners who let us use their windows for things. So what I expect will emerge will be kind of this vocabulary that we can apply with different types of projects and use different environments to convey what we're doing. So I, I think that's gonna be a different kind of a dynamic too. And even, you know, if we do labels with um, brown paper and markers, you know, and some, you know, might be more polished, but, you know, I think th that's gonna be the fun, you know, as we, you know, find our stories and use these different spaces to tell them. I, I think that's, that's part of the process and prototyping that we'll be doing. Keith, want to any closing words you want to offer here? You ready to get on a plane or get in your car and come on up to Amesbury and help us do this stuff? Yeah, I, I, um, I'm not going to take. I'm not going to fly. Um, <laughs> not yet. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I can't wait to see the space. And and again, yeah. uh, congratulations to all of you that are involved and want to be involved. And you know, I think um, providing the opportunity to you know, sort of allow your community to own, you know, this museum and to own this process is really, yep. uh, you know, great, you know, and I just, uh, if, if you can have some fun, you know, doing this as well. Um, That's pretty important too. I think, I think so. I mean, and, and that doesn't mean you, you uh, compromise uh, um, setting the bar, you know, high yep. and, right. and, and 
having your exhibits feel professional and, you yep. know, and, and I should say intentional, right? Um, right. So I think, you know, I think that that will, that I think that'll happen. Awesome. All and right. Well, I'm going to gonna, I'm gonna thank Keith Ragon for being with us tonight on our Behind the Scenes Live. Thank you, everybody, no, for joining us for your questions. Really love seeing people. And I got to tell you, that's the hardest part of this job right now. I'm so used to being in the community and interacting with people. Here we are on Zoom. It's the best we can do. Um, but thank you, Keith. Thank, thank you, everyone, for being with us. Thank you, Mara Goldsmith, for your good work, and Bonnie Brady, and to my board, and our architects, and this rich community of supporters. It's great to see you all.